believe it, baby. I was down with no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. I tried it for myself, and now I know what He did for me. I want to talk to you this morning about relevance. Is your life relevant? Does it make sense to you? I want to take a passage of scripture that has probably impacted a lot of our lives and share with you how this time, this season we're in, this, this time that we're dealing with now, how God can take us through the suffering that happens in our lives and Bless us to a point that we still prosper. But the key is making sure you know your life is relevant. So come on, join me in a word of prayer. First, I want to thank everybody for joining this morning. Virtually, those that are listening, I need you to go and make sure you tag us and hit that bell. Let us subscribe and like us, all of that. But right now, I got a word that God is saying is going to change your life. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for, again, you have outdone yourself. Uh, so many of us have climbed mountains we never thought we had the strength to climb. We've gone through some darkness and dead times in our life that should have taken us out, but we did not go out. And all praise, glory, and honor goes to you. But Lord, speak into someone's heart today, prepare their mind to know that you are taking them further, that this every day is just the beginning of a new day with you. Touch my mind, touch my mouth, touch the word that's come forth today. This is going to be something that's going to change someone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Navigate your way to the New Testament and see a very... I think familiar but powerful passage of scripture that today you can settle in. Come on, settle. God got this just for you. Settle down. Write it to it. I'm reading from the King James Version, chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. Hear ye the word of the Lord. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Oh, such a one will, of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, but that he heareth of me, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation that were given unto me a thorn in my flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice or three times, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For 
For when I am weak, then I am strong. This morning, for as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, we're going to speak from this thought. Once you learn to suffer, everything else is a piece of cake. Once you learn to suffer, everything else in life is a piece of cake. I have great news for you this morning. It will come as a revelation to some. To others, it will bring immediate comfort. But to others still, or to everyone else, it will encourage you. And here it is. Believers are not quitters. I know it's simple, but it's yet profound. It is also liberating. Because when you hear the word, believers, us, are not quitters. Those of us who are called by the name of God, those of us who are in a covenant relationship with God, those of you watching me who know that you have God, the reason you have not quit is because believers do not quit. God has equipped us with an internal endurance that helps us make it and an external connection to his spirit that helps us celebrate or find a way to worship even in our worst situations. I'm not the only one that understands there's been some terrible times in my life and because of my walk with the Lord, can I get a witness, the first thing that I think about is worshiping. Or where the folks like me to say, I've got to find God. Believers are not quitters. We do not lose. We do not go down. Now watch this. All I'm saying is God knows how to keep us. And we need to understand once we learn and once we get through some situations, we will learn that they will reinforce the fact that I haven't quit yet. I'm telling somebody that right now. I don't know what you're crying about now. You haven't quit yet. And if we look at the Word of God, the Bible tells us there are two main reasons, or no, there's a whole lot of reasons, but there are two main reasons that came to me as I was putting, preparing this Word today. Uh, God said this, the first reason, and you can write this, you're going to love this, the first reason you are not a quitter, the first reason we are not a quitter, the first reason those of us in a covenant relationship with God do not quit is because, first of all, we learn how to wrestle. Come on. Somebody's wrestling with something right now. We all learn to wrestle. Ephesians 6 and 12, the favorite verse on spiritual warfare, tells us about believers who are in league with God who have to wrestle. It says, Ephesians 6 and 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the forces of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. God tells us that we wrestle spiritually. Come on, everybody knows. See, what I'm trying to tell you is nobody just walks through without wrestling through something. And I'm talking about wrestling. The word wrestle there means a battle for your life. If I were to transliterate that word, how many can say, I'm not just doing church. I'm, just, I'm not just doing God. I have had literal moments where I battled through my life. And somebody can celebrate that that by God, but God was watching us wrestle because you've gone through, because you've been through some other things, because you have wrestled, God can bless you. How many can say I wrestle with sickness? You know what I'm talking about. Doctor appointment after doctor's appointment and doctors not being able to make you any better or medication, then wrong medication, then more medication or your body hurting constantly and you're taking pain pills or your body's hurting and things are not getting better and as soon as one thing heals, something else falls apart on our body. Many of us have had to wrestle and make it through our life while we were dealing with that. Some of us have had to wrestle with emotional, mental, uh, psychological pressures that we couldn't tell anybody or they would think we were crazy with the things that were flowing through our mind. You know what I'm talking about. You had to wrestle and you you made it through a day and you had to fight through the day or maybe you wrestled for a week somebody with me this morning maybe you wrestled for a month but then you finally laid your head down on a pillow and then comes a spirit of anxiety that won't let you sleep and then the, the devil or the enemy comes along and brings this doubt about all the things 
things God are doing, and now you're laying there, all of us have been there, laying there, trying to figure out, with God, the strongest God, with my God, as strong as he is, with all his power, why am I sitting here like this? So we get frustrated, and it only makes it worse. We've wrestled with that. Maybe some of us have wrestled even with the spirit of suicide. Think about what I'm saying. Nobody wants to own up to this. Nobody wants to think that they need to be in a crisis unit. Nobody wants to think that, you know, they're not strong enough to make it. But I will tell you, there are some forces of darkness out there that can attack and that have attacked believers. And the only reason you didn't go under was because when you held on to God, but the enemy did bring that spirit of suicide. Know how it comes? He'll whisper in your ear, there's no need to go on. This is the end. You can't make it. The devil is a liar. How many know as long as I have my God on my side, I'm going to get through any situation. You might as well take that stuff somewhere else. I've wrestled through too many things to give up now. I've wrestled through too much stuff to let the enemy take me out now. Maybe you wrestle with your finances, which is painful. Yeah, I said it. It's painful when you, ain't got, when you don't have any money. It's painful when you can't pay your bills and threaten the stuff being disconnected and some people are hungry and some people can't pay their rent and some people are living with other folks because they can't find a house. It's painful when you don't have money to pay things. Like a believer who called me up and said, was crying and said, I just don't have the money for my brilliant daughter who needs to go to this school and she wanted her daughter to go to one of the historical black universities and she said I'm at the center locally because I don't have the money. I saw her two years later and I said, well, how's things going? You know, what's going on with your daughter? She said, oh, she's in her junior year and named the college that she was going to. I said, how did you get there? She said, somehow we found the money. Can somebody write somehow? Won't God take us through somehow? Can somebody celebrate right now? I don't know where I'm at. But somehow, the Lord is going to bring me out of this situation because that's who God is. The second reason we're going to make it, not only because we've learned to wrestle, is because God will hold us up when we don't know how to stand. I need you to hear this. God will keep us when things get so weary in our lives that we can't make it. I'm talking to somebody right now. God is listening. He's hearing. He knows what's going on. He's preparing. He's laying things out for you so that you will make it through. All he wants you to do is get your attitude turned around so you can handle it. In the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John is a chapter where we have the I am of Jesus Christ. In that 10th chapter, he said, I am the good shepherd. And then he goes on to talk about how the good shepherd father functions. And then he goes into the verse and he says that my sheep hear my voice and another voice they will not follow. After that, in verse 28 and 29 of John chapter 10, listen to the power of why God tells us we won't have to worry about quitting because of what he does. He said, and I give to them, verse 28, eternal life and they shall never perish and no man shall be able to pluck them out of my hand. Verse 29 is reinforcing because he says, and my father who gave them to me, watch this, my father gave them to me and no man will be able to pluck them out of his hands. And I saved the best for last because that verse says, he is greater than all. Did you hear the verse? My father who gave them to me is greater than all. Greater than all? Greater than anything you're going through. God is greater than what you're facing right now. God is greater than what the enemy is telling you right now. Somebody ought to write something right now. If you could check that out, send that out, just write it down. God is greater. Write your, write your issue there. Right? Write what's happening in your life right now. And I want you to celebrate the fact that there's a God who's greater. So we know believers aren't quitters. We know we can celebrate that. Why? We wrestle through too many stuff. I, rest, I got too many t-shirts to back up now. We know believers aren't quitters because we got a God who closes his hands around us and looks at the devil and say, I dare you to take him out. Yeah, we got it, we got it, we got it. Yay, yay, uh-oh. But we got a problem. We got a problem. Listen to me. Why are there still so many believers who allow week after week, allow the bottom to fall out before they trust God? Why are there so many believers whom God 
has shown himself strong living such unhappy and hopeless life. Why are there so many believers who listen to word after word after word, hear me somebody, and you now have surrendered, have given up, thrown in the flag, you surrendered to the struggle. You surrendered to the problem. You surrendered to the pressure. You surrendered to not growing, to stay in the same place. There's some of you that had power, oh, I hate to say this, four years ago that you don't have now. And it's not God's power that's moved. It's the fact that we have not done or been or understood where we are. So you need to understand we got a problem, but what God wants me to lay on you this morning, what God wants me to tell you this morning is a game changer. If you follow the principles of this text, do you understand what God is saying? It's a game changer. Game changer, the definition means it is an event, a procedure, or an idea that shifts dramatically the way things are done. It's an idea or event or procedure that shifts dramatically the way things are done. I'm telling you, if you listen to what Pastor Paul said in this text, that you're going to have find yourself shifted into a new way of life. You're going to relate to God differently. You're going to find some new joy, new peace. You better listen because there is some power for Pastor Paul telling us that what God wants to lay on us is one of the weapons that we don't cherish. It's one of the weapons in our repertoire that we don't like to use. It's one of the weapons that we think is a bad weapon. But here is the truth of the matter. Once you learn to handle suffering, once you know, I got to get up this morning and suffer, but you have it. Once you learn to sing when it's raining. Once you learn how to stand and stand strong in the most dramatic and howling winds trying to blow your life off track. Once you can be in a storm and know that even though I'm in this storm, I won't fall apart. Once you get to the point that you don't dread suffering, listen to me. Life then becomes a piece of cake. Understand what I'm saying? When the Holy Spirit said that to me, I said, that's kind of crazy. God, what are you saying? He said, a piece of cake means it's not easy, but life will become pleasurable. Oh, you ready to hear this revelation? Life will be pleasurable because even though I'm going through this stuff, I'm never going alone. No, I'm never alone. The pleasure is no matter how bad the enemy gets on me, no matter how deep my stuff gets, I got a God who I know can get me out of it. So the pleasure is I can lean on the rock. That's higher than I. The pleasure is I got a God who has all power in his hand. The pleasure is I have not gone under yet. Somebody need to understand life becomes a piece of cake once you learn how to suffer. You can do like Job. You no, know Job said, Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Interesting. Many of us want to look at the mood of Job and and look at some of the things and try to run right to the end of the book. But listen to what Job was saying, his knowledge internally. He said, wait a minute, my God's in charge of everything. And he's allowing this stuff to happen in my life. He's allowing the bulls and the boils on my body and the sickness and losing my family. But he said, even though I'm in all of this trouble, even though I'm suffering, this is when it becomes dramatic. He says, though he, look what he talked about. He said, God, even when I don't understand what you're doing, even when it looks like you're allowing all kind of calamity in my life, I will still trust you. That's powerful because he understood. And if we can look at Habakkuk, one of the most powerful scriptures is Habakkuk 3, 17, 18. Though the fig tree does not bud. And there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God, my Savior. This is what he said. Although nothing in my life is working, I learned how to rejoice. You better learn how to handle suffering. And once you do, the enemy got nothing else for you. Let's face it. The only thing the enemy can do is make, give you dread because he says, something you're happy, you're going to suffer. But when you say, I've been there, already suffered. Anybody got some suffering behind them? Like I said, you're wasting your breath on me. I've already suffered. I know how to suffer. But now you got to flip that to what Paul is saying here because the greatest verse on suffering. Not just Job, not just Habakkuk. The greatest example of how suffering blesses us and what suffering does and what God does through suffering, say with me, is in this text with Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul 
were words that let us know suffering will still bring glory to God. Suffering is a part of who we are. He, he, he wrote words to let us know that everything that happened in his life, he was still able to write the gospel and trust God. You know what it says in chapter 11, the, the verse, the chapter right before the verse, the chapter we're on, it said that he was left in the deep. He was in beatings and he was whipped and he was uh, left for dead and, and he was in danger to his countrymen and, and he was in robbery and he was running. All of this stuff happened to Paul. And the crazy thing is, you know when Paul got, when Paul actually was saved, turned his life over to Christ. Remember, he was, had letters to go and kill those in the way, right? Many of us know that that's, that was our story, that before we came into church, we were probably some of the most, uh, uh, we did some of the most egregious acts to people in church, said all kinds of stuff about it. But then God touched our life, and the same thing that happened to Paul happened to us. He got blinded, he got knocked off the horse and was blinded. And then God chose him. And if we pick this up in Acts chapter 9, we'll find out that God went to Ananias and said, there's a man, he's blind, I need you to go over there, I need you to get him because I need him. And when Ananias found out his name, he said, Lord, we heard about this man. He has letters, he's killing us. But Jesus, but God told him in that 15th verse, please listen, 915, he said, Ananias, go! I like when God throws the indictment in there. God throws those orders in there. He said, God, he said, I have to show this man. This man is going to speak my name to the Gentiles and their kings. And he's going to be more responsible for taking the gospel. But I need you to go and get him. Look at the last part of that verse. So I can show him the things he has to suffer. You need to understand something. Paul was... Was, was picked to do a great job with God. And with any great job with God, they are suffering. I'm just telling those who are suffering, you better rejoice because you're going to wrestle through some stuff. you got a God who won't let you go. And since you've been through some stuff, you're going to make it. Let's look at this text very quickly. I'm going to ask this out. I want you to see this. Although this book is called 2 Corinthians, even within the reading of this book, we find out that this is not the second letter Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Uh, several times Paul says, or a couple times Paul says, this third letter I write. Um, if we go to the second verse, you'll find out Paul talks about the painful visit from in between the first visit and the second visit. And you'll find out that he actually founded this church of Corinth in Acts chapter 18. And when Paul founded this church, after you guys started, there was trouble. You know what 1 Corinthians said. Uh, Paul had to go back because there was all kind of idolatry and incest and all kind of things happening. But the main thing that was happening is they were divided. Some was following Apollos, some was following Paul. They were following men. They were used to worshiping idols and following men. They were used to worshiping idols and following men. They never got comfortable giving uh, giving God the right glory because they're so used to having things. Can I tell you something? We are living in the last days and the Bible tells us there's going to be a lot of false teachers. There's going to be a lot of error being taught. There's going to be a lot of blasphemy being taught and traditions being taught and things that have nothing to do with the power of God. I'm going to admonish you right now. You might be in trouble because of who you're following. Here's what I would tell somebody. I'm not even talking about following Pastor Douglas or following your favorite, or whoever your favorite preacher is virtually. All I'm telling you is this, that you better learn the word for yourself. The Bible says study to show yourself approved, a workman unto God that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. Do you know only the people that feed themselves can understand what somebody else is feeding them what's wrong? Hallelujah, somebody. That's why you follow and go off on the wrong tangent is because when you allow to tell you stuff that you haven't studied yourself. In that verse it says, study to show yourself approved. When you study, you please God. Can you see God hanging out over heaven and God shows up and inspires you, gives you inspiration and then he lets you know what's right or wrong and the Holy Spirit comes in and tells you how to interpret the stuff you don't know how to interpret. You better learn and be careful. Just follow him there and know you got some word. When you got your own word, you got victory. No word, no victory. And then Paul wrote this letter. Let's go on. He wrote this letter. Because when he sent the letter, a lot of people got harsh with him. He fell out with a lot of them. Some listened, some didn't. 
We think there was a visit in between, and then in this text it says they were making up. Some of the people were coming over. So Paul wrote this letter to establish or reestablish his relationship with them. He wrote this letter to let them know that they were still together, but there were still some problems going on. Now, in the section that we're in, the context is chapters 10 to 13 is where Paul, after admonishing them and all the love stuff in the first chapters, he's now talking to them about the false teachers. The false teachers are, 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 are just arguing with him, and they want him to show proof of his apostleship. Paul wasn't flashy. He didn't dress well. He wasn't one of the good orators. You know, we get stuck on what people look like and what people say. But Paul said, you're following the wrong thing and he started arguing and then he got mad around chapter 10 look if y'all don't boast about what you've been through then Paul in chapters 10 and 11 he laid out some stuff and none of them and he continued at the top of verse 12 look at the first verse says I must go on boasting although there is nothing to be gained for it I will go from business here's what Paul said he was arguing with these false teachers and he was showing proof of his apostleship and who he was. And then he had pulled out all kind of proof. But in the top of the 12th chapter, he pulled out some truth that they could not argue with. He pulled out suffering. He pulled out something that you didn't find anywhere else. And it wasn't what happened to him when he had gotten saved. Because this says 14 years. That means it was after that period that he had saw God. Listen, what Paul was telling us indirectly, and what other people may know, somebody may hear this, you can't just be going from church to church, turning your channel from YouTube to YouTube. You can't just read over here, and there's a revival over here, and here's something that makes you shout, but you don't grow yourself. Do you hear me? But you don't have any word on the inside of you. Paul was saying, there's so many times when I'm not with you that the revelations of God come in my spirit. As a matter of fact, talking about itself, I knew a man. Is there anybody that can celebrate that I know it wasn't good, but I know where my health comes 
strong. And that's how we learn. First, they said, you got to stop boasting. Boasting is pride. Pride will kill revelations. Pride will make you fall. In the summer of 1986, there was a, a great collision of two ships on the Black Sea outside of Russia. And the story goes that hundreds of people died. People were incensed, they were angry, but when they found the reason for the death, when they investigated it, they were even more incensed. They found out that the reason for the death was not because of any kind of malfunction of a radar system. It wasn't that there was too much fog they couldn't see. The reason for the death is both captains knew the presence of the other ship but neither one of them wanted to yield there right away. They both were so powerful, nobody was going to yield first. And they kept, can you believe this? They kept driving those ships because nobody wants to give in. Pride tells you not to give in. Pride tells you it's all about you. And they crashed and it was too late and all those people died. Here's the problem. Pride in you makes you not able to handle suffering because the first thing you think about when suffering comes, you don't think about God. Suffering is about what God is going to do in you. That's good. The suffering is about what God is going to do in you because even our Savior had to suffer. Paul said in verse 3, he said, look, I saw the man when he said that last verse, verse 5, I will not boast in anything but my weaknesses. Wow. Paul, are you, are you sure you want to say that? You want to boast in your weaknesses? Yeah. You know what I want to boast about? I want to boast that with all God knows about me, with all the times I messed up, with my propensity to fail him, with the times that I looked up and not did the right thing, when I do the right thing, come on, somebody go with me, and yet he still forgives me, he still keeps me, he still loves me. Let me boast about that. Let me boast about a God who has that unconditional love. And bring, See, the reason I don't have to worry about me getting caught up in the dread of the suffering is because I gotta think behind the suffering because a lot of times we don't think we deserve the suffering when in fact you do but God covers you with his love. Somebody ought to celebrate and that's what Paul said. He said look I don't know I had time. Some of y'all don't know I was trying to murder folk and God saved me. So if he could accept me as I am I'm gonna boast about God. God has blessed me to the point that I don't know how and why he wanted to do it, but I'm not the only one, and I did not deserve it. The second point in this text is verse 6 where it says, the presence of suffering and what God does with it. Here's where Robert meets the room. Paul is saying, you got to make sure you don't boast, that you give God glory, and if you do boast, boast in the Lord. So I was, it was funny when I got to the sixth verse where it says, and if I should choose to boast. Wait a minute, Paul. You just said you're not going to boast. But see, that's the problem. We can always say what we're not going to do, but we can't do what we say we're not going to do without the help of the Lord. Everybody understand that? All of us are doing well. We will run to God when we're in trouble. Come on. But then, once we get back on our feet, we have a propensity of doing our own thing. So he said, even if I should boast, what God did, and he's talking about why the thorn in the flesh was flesh was given unto him, and he gives three reasons in verse 6 as he starts. He said, first of all, so I would not boast again. What are we talking about? Why is he still talking about boasting? Because he has to guard us from ourselves. Can you write down, God, please save me from me? Sometimes I'm going, God, Lord, how did that come out of my mouth? How did I, Lord, I know better, and I'm stepping on the same mess over and over again. And and, and he said, I, I got to save you because as righteous as you are, you still can go off. What do I mean? Solomon was the greatest and wisest man who ever lived. But if you go into the 11th chapter of 1 Kings, you'll find out that Solomon, in verse 4, said that his women turned his heart from God and he no longer followed the God of his father David. This is what I'm saying. The wisest man that ever lived, and he was doing well for God, took down all the groves, built a temple for the Lord, and yet even he started and God said, the first thing I do, if I give you a thorn, you won't be slipping. He said, so I'm going to make sure that happens. The 
The second time a spider like that. But I'm telling you, maybe what God is doing is protecting you so you don't go back doing what you were doing. The second thing he said is, there's other people, he says, so other people won't, you know, start thinking I'm more than him. Some of us get so hooked on the praises of others. You know, we were designed to serve God and praise God and worship God. I got some bad news for you. If you don't worship God, you'll worship something or someone. Oh, I need you to think about the priority in your life. Is God that priority? Because if you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping something or someone. Or you get caught up in the praise of people. The worst people in the world are those living for other people to validate them through their worship and praise. Can I tell you, you're heading down the wrong track if you're waiting on people to validate you. You better learn how to validate yourself in front of the Lord. Grab you some Psalm 40 and tell yourself, I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. Every now and then, when suffering comes in your life, you ought to go somewhere and just have yourself a party. You ought to celebrate yourself because you know that God did not bring you out this far so he can leave you and leave you in a position you're in. He's going to take you further and God has some more power for you. And plus, and plus, the celebration is you're connected to the, to the great God. And God said when you're connected to me, there's nothing impossible. So first he wanted to make sure he didn't boast. And then he said, I don't want to be. He said, and then the third thing is, I don't want to be exalted. So let me say three things in there. Uh, I gotta stop boasting. So God said, I know you said you're gonna stop, but I'm gonna help you by getting the authority. I'm gonna make sure you don't get your head all big because what other people are doing, as soon as other people start telling us stuff, we wanna go get a church. Uh, we wanna go get a, a business. We wanna, all kind of this. And we're not ready for it. And then, the last thing is, so you get exalted. He said, and then I gotta watch out for me. Because of these things, I might get it. So what, what happens? God said, here is why. Once you learn suffering, everything else is a piece of cake. He said, so I would not be conceited by these revelations that was given unto me a thorn in the flesh. Paul's thorn in the flesh, we've all heard it many times. Paul's thorn in the flesh was, um, some people have said, they don't know what it is. I mean, we believe he was talking metaphorically. But anyway, Paul said, some have some eyes. It could have been an eye disease. It could have been uh, migraine headaches. It, uh, they said it could have been epilepsy or seizure, whatever it was. Paul said, I sought God three times to get rid of it, and God would not take it away. And God doesn't take some things away, and he's given us a reason, the greatest reason in the world, why God does not take stuff away is because of that ninth verse. Here's what happens when you suffer and why you should love suffering and know that suffering is going to bring you out better. When you suffer, the Bible says, his grace is sufficient. God said, no. Whatever you're in, I got enough grace to get you out. No matter what's going on into your life, because I love you, because of my grace, what is my grace? Uh, uh, you know, my unmerited favor for you, this, this favor thing I got going on in your life. You know the time when I rescued you and hugged you and held you all night? You know the days when nobody else knew what you were going through and I made sure you didn't go under? Come on, somebody know what I'm talking about? You know the times when you prayed and maybe looked at the prayer wasn't going to be answered, but later you looked around and I didn't answer your prayer. I got a favor thing going on with you. Come on, celebrate it. Say it. The roof on our church was damaged in a storm. It had been leaking for years. First it was just drizzling in, right? But then the water started running in, messing up the, the tile, ceiling tiles, and messing up the corners, and messing up the wall. And so um, we decided to call on our insurance company to get it fixed. But one of my deacons came to me and said, Pastor, we get a, uh, a jester. That's all he does. He can come in and do this job better than us. Just turn it over to the insurance company. I never heard about that, but I said, I trust you. So he did, and the guy came, and I'll never forget. I went outside when the adjuster got here, and he had a drone in his trunk. He took the drone out. They had a camera on it, and the drone began to fly over the roof and take pictures, and we could see the damage on the ground. I thought he would have to get a ladder to get up there, much as I know. He was doing that, but that's not the part that got me. Then the drone started flying over the fellowship hall. So I, I, I you know, turned to the deacon, I looked at him and said, man, why is the drone going way over there? And he just looked at me and said, no, 
The way your insurance policy is made, uh, once we fix this roof, we can get all of the damage on any of your roofs to qualify under your insurance. I said, what? He said, yeah, you're going to get all of this. You understand what I'm saying? That's how God's grace works. Some things that we can think of, he already thought of, and God's doing stuff that we don't know what he's doing, just like I didn't know what that insurance man was doing, but God always has an extra clause that's going to get you out. Somebody ought to celebrate the fact that God said, I'm not only going to take care of you a little while, as bad as it gets, my grace is sufficient. My grace can handle your cancer. My grace can handle your problem with your children. My grace can handle what's going on in your mind. Lay your head down. Trust me. No need of you being up all night. God said, if you trust me and learn how to handle suffering, the rest of your life becomes joyful because you now bury that in your trust for God. He said, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. The more violently you are afflicted, the more strength God applies. Let's look at the last part, last point. So first of all, there's a prelude to suffering for God in our call that we have to make sure we get rid of all of our boasting. We get rid of all the you know stuff worrying about me that we understand what God is doing. Secondly, we have to then understand in the presence of suffering, God is always sufficient and takes us to a point to bless us. That's why we love it, because God is there. Then the third point is the power from understanding suffering. Here comes the flip. Here comes the text. Paul said, since I asked God three times to take this and he didn't, since I know God knows about it, since I know God is allowing it to happen, here comes your shout. Since I know God will never let me go under, since I know God has all resources in his hands, since I know the Lord is never void of power, since I know I still belong to him, somebody got it yet? He said, therefore, I'm going to boast gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. The key to handling suffering in your worst weakness is to boast about your God. Somebody ought to say right now, my God is making a way. My God is going to show up. My God has never let me down. You got to boast of your own? Just say it. My God already knows. That means he's bringing me out. God is going to do a boast about him. And then he said, I delight. Watch this. Look at the suffering. I delight in weaknesses. Insults. What? In hardships. In persecutions. In difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Paul flipped it. He goes further. He says, I delight in these things. Once you learn there's a power that comes from suffering that can't be gotten any kind of way. You can't experience it. Unless you experience God's suffering. What am I saying? The Bible says suffering brings joy and maturity. James, count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptation, know that the trying of your faith works. Patience, patience, the word is transliterated, maturity. And so let, let patience have this perfect work so you can be perfect, mature, and entire, wanting nothing. God said when you suffer and you do it with joy, somebody ought to have some joy in your suffering. You can make yourself smile. You can make yourself shout. You can make yourself laugh. When you remember, God's going to bring me joy that is not dependent on my circumstances. Suffering will make sure there's some joy in our life. And I love it because suffering, as he did with Job, if you learn how to stand, can bring you a double trouble. Somebody look at me right now. You're asking God for one thing. Can I give you something to shout about? He's going to give you more than you ask for. He's getting ready to take you to that other thing you're afraid to ask him for. I just got a revelation from God. He's getting ready to bless you with a healing. He's going to bless you with the thing you need. I see somebody that's been praying and hoping and trusting. Well, the day God is saying through this text, he's going to do it. If you learn. I'm done, but I got to tell you this as I close. There was a, a pastor who went to this woman's house. She was a musician. And when he walked in, he heard this bird singing. But the bird just wasn't singing a song. You know how birds sing, but he heard the bird chirping notes to a familiar melody. And he thought he was dreaming, but he heard it again. Then he walked into a room and he saw a bird in a cage. So he asked the owner, he said, is that, am, I, am I dreaming or is that bird chirping out a song? He said, no. He said, what I do at night in his corner of the room, the lights are out when I'm playing and practicing my music. So while he's in the dark, he has no distractions. 
He's learned how to sing the melodies because he's learned to function in the dark. Our brothers and sisters, I'm closing, but you better learn in the dark is the best place to hear the melody of God. And when you learn how to handle suffering, the enemy got nothing else for you, and life becomes pleasurable because you have a God who can handle it. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Please uh, follow the prompts on our screen for how to get in touch with us. But God bless you and say this to yourself right now. I'm getting ready to sing in the rain. I'm getting ready to jump around in my storm. And I'm getting ready to celebrate my darkness. God bless you. To him and leave it there. I was down but with the no way up. And I needed some help. Everybody. Breathing but not living. Just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. I tried it for myself and now I know what he did.